Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Lauren Poindexter, and with me is my co-moderator, Dr. Lauren Rudolph. We are going to be discussing this evening how to find a job in sports medicine, practical steps, and expert wisdom. We have a fantastic group of six panelists who are going to share their viewpoints with you and also um, field any questions that you may have. Of note, this is part of AMSSM's Early Career Blueprint series. If you have missed any in the past or miss any in the future, don't worry, all of this will be recorded and available um, via the AMSSM website. Moving forward, um, our overview for today, we're going to be looking at what AMSSM resources are available to both non-members and members alike. These resources include early career data, job search recommendations from the fellowship field manual, and we'll go through a press practice job search on AMSSM's career center. Then we'll transition to our panelist discussion. Of note, there will be a short period of time at the end of our discussion today when we will stop the recording. So any panelists or attendees who want to ask or answer questions off the record will feel free to do so. Speaking of panelists, here are our fantastic panelists today. We have Dr. Portugal from NYU Langone Health, Dr. Barchi, who is in Delaware and Pennsylvania, Dr. Alicia Gendi, Dr. Shelley Callender, <laughs> Dr. Nate Nye, and last but not least, Dr. Caitlin Mooney. We will we'll introduce our panelists more in depth later on in today's session. So the AMSSM resources we'll review today um, remind me so much of Mary Poppins carpet bag. So when you log into the AMSSM website, um, there's so many different directions you can go. So the benefits of membership specifically are fantastic for um, physicians or trainees of any level, specifically residents, fellows, and early career professionals. Um, for the record, I've used all of these job search resources in the not so distant past. So benefits of membership um, include data from the recent salary survey results and dating 10 years past. There's also the fellowship field manual, the career center, um, and of course, news updates. So here is what a, um, the home screen looks like for AMSSM. We'll take a quick tour through the highlights of this website. If you first look in the upper right hand corner, there's a red oval. That's what you'll see after you sign in to the website. You can explore member content by using the link just to the right of your name. Hopefully my cursor appears. You can also click on membership as indicated by the arrow here. If you were to click on member content um, in the upper right hand corner by your name, um, you will find a list of salary surveys. Understanding the financial landscape, if you will, of AMSSM member salaries can help you gauge the appropriateness of your job offer or offers. It's also really helpful to prepare a budget. We'll explore the 2021 results in just a minute. From the home page, if you were to click on education from this horizontal menu as indicated by the red oval here, you'll get a vertical drop down menu that offers resources by training level. The lock icon indicates resources that are available to members only. For job search related info, you can click on fellowship member resources indicated by the arrow here. That's gonna take you to a new page. Today, we're going to touch upon the Fellowship Field Manual PDF, which is embedded under Current Fellows. Last but not least, also under the Membership tab is the Career Center. So you can search positions here without logging in, but if you want to apply directly to any of these jobs through the Career Center, you do need to enter the Password Protected Portal, as shown here. All right, so let's look at this early career data. Um, we're gonna take a deeper dive into each of the primary specialties. Understanding this landscape is really important because going into your job search with a clear definition of what to expect can help you better appreciate what you are and aren't offered. 
So when should anybody start their job search? It's really never too early. Um, depending on where you are in relationship to your subspecialty training, pre-fellowship or current fellow, there's basic stats on when fellows sign their first contract. Less than 5% of fellows sign their contract prior to fellowship. The majority sign in the last six months of their fellowship and 25% of fellows even sign their job contracts after fellowship is completed. So depending where you are in your subspecialty training, um, I want you to focus on what that primary specialty um, commands in terms of average job salary. Before we get into that data, I really wanna thank Dr. Leisler, who's at Notre Dame. He helped to compile this information. The most recent iteration of the salary survey was returned by 782 physicians. The majority of them were family medicine docs and a third of the respondents had five or less years of experience as staff physicians. So this information is very relevant to all of you. When we look at the 65 respondents who are entry level physicians, we see that the average salary is almost $229,000. Unfortunately, if you're a woman, you're going to make an average of $2,500 less. Um, we definitely don't have to time today to go into why that is, um, but just wanted to make this number um, aware to all of you. So if you feel the need um, to provide a little bit of pushback or some negotiation in your contract, um, do you understand that what these numbers show in general. At the bottom of the slide, you'll see that the range for all entry level physicians who responded to the salary survey is anywhere between $132,500 to $330,000. A lot of that depends on practice location. Here's a breakdown of respondents by each primary specialty. The colored bars indicate years of experience. Red represents physicians with zero to one year of experience. Yellow is zero to five years of experience. And blue is six plus years of experience. And these numbers represent the 50th percentile. You'll notice that the Y axis on the left is represented in US dollars. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go through one by one through the specialties with the actual dollar amount is. So do make a note of the X axis and what your primary specialty is. First, we're gonna look at family medicine. The 50th percentile of respondents who had zero to one years of experience is $230,000. Once those respondents um, had six or more years of practice, the 50th percentile um, salary range increased to $277,000. Um, and I'd like to make a note that Andy made a fantastic comment in the chat. Um, the Dr. Leisler did cover this most recent membership survey in greater depth during a webinar, and he did uh, make the link available to you. When we move on to PM&R, the numbers are just a little bit higher. Uh, 240,500 is the 50th percentile entry level for physicians zero to one years in practice. PEDS, a little bit lower, 220,000. Med PEDS combined is lower than that. And I think it'd be fantastic for us to figure out why those numbers are a little bit smaller. I don't have that information for you today. Internal medicine physicians, a little bit higher, 232,500. And last but not least, our emergency medicine physicians. Um, there were no respondents with zero to one years of experience, so we don't have data on that. But if you look at the aggregate of zero to five years of experience, um, those physicians commanded um, a salary of 300,000 in the 50th percentile. Moving on, it's important to note um, what your patient makeup may look like. So think to yourself, do you want to see a combination of patients in your primary specialty and sports patients, or are you looking for sports patients only? 
There's also a very small minority of sports medicine um, trained physicians who only see patients in their primary specialty. So team coverage of the physician respondents who are currently a team physician, I picked out those who have zero to five years in practice. So this is if you're wondering what types of athletes early career professionals care for. Um, this is based on that 258 responses. So the majority serve as a team physician for sports organizations of any level. This is a really important slide, I think. Um, I'm not sure that a lot of physicians in training understand that team coverage isn't always reimbursed. Um, and if it is reimbursed, um, the stipend may go to your healthcare institution and not necessarily you as an individual. Um, but 82.4% of respondents to this survey indicated that they do not receive a stipend for covering these teams. Last but not least, we're going to review the AMSSM field, uh, fellowship field manual before moving on to our panelist discussion. To review, it can be navigated to from the ASSM homepage by choosing the education tab and selecting fellowship from the drop down menu. The fellowship field manual is clearly listed here for fel uh, current fellows and anybody can access this even if you're a resident, this is still available for you. Um, the PDF is also available via a direct link if anyone's interested or having trouble finding it. The last update of the manual was in 2021, and I want to thank the AMSSM members who've contributed to this document over the years. One of the things you want to consider as you start your job search is what type of job are you looking for? I intentionally put this photo of these women, um, high school or college lacrosse athletes, because I want each of you to think about is, is this the type of sport and this the type of setting that you would enjoy covering on the weekend on an unpaid basis? If it is um, right up your alley, then that's important to notice um, or take note of. If this is not something you'd be interested in doing, then you may want to avoid searching for jobs in upstate New York, for example. Um, so looking at this diagram here, we look at some of the different factors that you may want to consider before going out on your job search. When we talk about practice type, we talk about private practice versus an academic practice, um, something that's community focused versus maybe a tertiary or quaternary healthcare type structure. Which geographic region is best for you? Do you need to be near a beach or your family? What is your primary specialty? Is there a chance that you might be the only PMNR physician in your practice? Or are you a family medicine physician and you wanna join a, um, a practice of only family medicine physicians and you could be the musculoskeletal specialist? So consider who you may be surrounded by and what is interesting or valuable to you. What type of sports are you interested in covering? Are they already covered by your partners? Um, or do you have to go out into the community and develop those relationships de novo? What type of benefits are important to you? So some of you may have spouses um, that are interested, you guys are interested in getting pregnant and you think there may be a baby in the next couple of years, it's going to be really important for you to look at what type of benefits are available for maternal and paternal leave, um, also health care for um, child dependents. 401k matching, um, I challenge you is way more important than you think it is. Um, I feel very blessed with my 401k um, plan. Also diversity, um, whether it's diversity of gender, nationality, um, cultural habits, religion, etc. Do consider um, what type of diverse environment you're interested in being in. And then as always, like, does your family or do you have a partner um, that has a say in the matter? Because that's really important too. Um, if, they, if you are dragging them behind you, kicking and screaming, um, then no one's going to be happy. 
So networking is super important. A few things to note. Um, a few things to note. Networking is valuable at all stages of your profession. So just considering mentorship, asking your mentors to review or help you develop your CV considering that the interactions that you have with those of us here in the meeting or at AMSSM meetings or even on the sidelines during tournaments, um, yes, be yourself, but also consider um, that those are like potential job interviews, right? Reach out to professional friends of friends if you're interested um, in working in a specific region. Maintain your professional relationships along the road and make sure you attend those meetings so that you can get to know others, um, others in this field. So important things to watch out for, and I put coffee here because I want you to stay awake, stay stimulated and focus on some of these concepts. Don't forget to read the fine print in your contracts. Don't assume that you know everything about law because you took one undergrad class um, in legal matters. Make sure you get um, an objective lawyer to review your contract. Consider what are the negotiables and non-negotiables. So negotiables might include paid leave, it might include maternity or paternity benefits, um, et cetera. Also, are there going to be call requirements included in your job? Is there an existing contract for sports coverage? Are you part of that contract, et cetera? Also, are you gonna be the only professional of your kind in your office? You're gonna need an ally if that's the case. Going solo may not be something you wanna do immediately after um, fellowship. You may wanna get a few years of professional experience before you open up a practice of your own. It takes a long time to obtain licensure and to complete all of the documents and onboarding requirements for just about any hospital. Um, I had to actually get credentialed at I think four or five institutions, which took a very long time. Um, so do realize that you can't start seeing patients until all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Marketing, who is going to market for you when you join a practice? Are you going to have to get make your own flyers and take them to, you know, local jujitsu um, institutions or any sort of like you know, mom and pop like gymnastics um, organizations, or are you going to be working for a large healthcare network that's going to put out like an e-blast um, notifying, notifying all of their employees of your presence, okay? So big difference. And then also case logs. If you are um, needing to supply case logs, just a reminder, stay on top of your new innovations or your ACGME case logs and make sure those are thorough. So last but not least, I'm going to give you a quick tour of the Career Center, because I know the most important thing is you guys all want to learn from our um, panelists tonight. So here's the Career Center. You can find it by clicking on the membership tab. Um, and again, if you want to create a login because you're interested in applying through the Career Center, then there's the sign in button. Here's a sample um, search. So when I clicked on um, job seeker, I typed in keywords urgent care. Let's say I'm an emergency medicine physician and I do wanna do some time um, in an urgent care type setting. So I typed in urgent care and I clicked on all locations and then I clicked the search button. Seven jobs came up and the top two on the left with the gray shading, that indicates that those are sponsored positions. Let's say California is not so much my speed, but I'm more interested in Minnesota. I'm gonna click on the Minnesota link down here. Interestingly enough, I am from California. But so let's look at this Minnesota job. So it's a primary care sports medicine physician, orthopedic urgent care. Here are the details of when it was posted, where its location is, whether it's full-time or part-time um, and what type of sector it's in. There's always gonna be a great description of the job. You can save the job if you wish. You can also apply now and that's gonna require you to have a login through the Career Center. If you scroll down on this one job um, application, you'll see here that an individual's um, email address is listed and they recommend that you apply online. Some, um, some job postings will only have you apply through the AMSSM website. Um, others, you will also apply directly. 
They mentioned here at the bottom, previous experience in urgent care emergency medicine is highly desirable. You can also create a job alert for similar jobs. Scrolling down even further, there's another blue button that may um, connect you to LinkedIn and you can see um, who is working there, Maybe you have um, some fellow friends from medical school that are also employed by this organization. All right, so that part is over. And now we're excited to introduce our panelists to you. I'm only gonna share with them a little bit briefly, um, a little bit about them briefly. And then I'm gonna have each of them discuss more in depth about what their sports coverages are like um, and what their daily responsibilities um, might include based on their primary specialty. So expert wisdom and personal reflections are gonna be shared with you this evening. Each of them are going to discuss what I wish I had known and what I see fellows doing well or not well. We're gonna spend about two minutes per panelist introducing these topics. And then we're going to move on to the um, Q&A section. So first is Dr. Salvador Portugal. As I mentioned, he's from NYU Langone Health and practices in New York City. His primary specialty is PM&R, and he also specializes in non-operative spine treatment. Dr. Elizabeth Barchi is employed through Christiana Care, practices out of both Delaware and Pennsylvania. She has a particular specialty in performing arts and was originally trained in pediatrics. Alicia Gendy, I hope I said that correctly, um, is employed through the Mayo Clinic Health System, primarily in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Her background is in emergency medicine, and she was once a flight nurse in, did I say that correctly? Was it a flight nurse or it was an um, army nurse? I'm sorry if I, if I butchered that. Um, so she does, yep, so she does have military experience and can speak to that. Dr. Shelley Street Callender is employed in um, Macon, Georgia through Navicent Health, and her background is in dual pediatrics with internal medicine. Dr. Nate Nye is here. He's currently serving in the U.S. Air Force as a Lieutenant Colonel. Congratulations on your recent promotion. He's stationed at um, Fort Belvoir. Did I totally butcher that? Because I'm sure I did. Um, that's in Fairfax County, Virginia. His background is in family medicine, and obviously he can uh, speak to um, his military experience. Last but not least, Dr. Caitlin Mooney is at the University of Texas Health System in San Antonio, and her background is in pediatrics. So I will turn it over to Dr. Lauren Rudolph, um, and we can go ahead and start off with Dr. Portugal. Should I start talking? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm like, you can go ahead and talk whenever you want. Um, yeah, sure. so if you yeah. will share a um, few more details about your current practice, what you sure. wish you had known going into the job market, and what do you see your fellows doing well or not well? Gotcha. Hey, okay. sorry, I um, was trying to get the question off the chat so we could answer it, and then you, it was like the one time. Um, I also wanted, before you get started, um, I wanted to um, add that we didn't get to formally introduce Dr. Poindexter. Um, and I would say as a recommendation for the future, if you're ever giving a talk and someone wants to introduce you, you should definitely let them because then I'm sure in future jobs, people get more information about you. And it's always nice to have someone talk about you. Um, so let's just take a moment. Um, so Dr. Poindexter is originally from Southern California. She now works at the University of Arkansas as a board certified PM&R and sports medicine specialist. She completed PM&R sports fellowship at NYU and you will see several of her former colleagues from NYU here, which is awesome. Her current practice includes coverage of the Razorback, Razorback athletics and she's um, She's going to be traveling with, I think, women's soccer soon, which is really cool. Um, she also does interventional spine procedures, concussion management, and treatment of musculoskeletal injuries in patients of all ages. And note, she was a former athletic trainer, so she has done this sports medicine job search thing a few times. Um, and then also wanted to give a shout out to Caitlin, who's one, Mooney, who this 
whole series is really just a, a brainchild of Caitlin. So um, thanks for being here and joining us as a panelist. Um, so going forward, um, Salvador, Dr. Portugal, do you want to start with the questions? Did you, um, sure. do we need to go over them again or? I know. So I'll just introduce myself, Sal Portugal, as uh, Dr. Poindexter had uh, already stated. I'm an interventional spine and sports doc here at NYU. Um, and I, I guess uh, my current role is a team physician for the St. Joseph's University in Brooklyn, a D3 program in obviously Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. I'm also the fellowship director of the Sports Master Fellowship Program within the Department of PMNR, as well as the medical director of the uh, sports medicine rehabilitation within our own department. Um, just a little additional background about myself. So initially my thought was after completing fellowship was I would automatically just go return back to NYU and uh, um, bring back the knowledge that I learned for fellowship and uh, bring it to the residency program. Unfortunately or fortunately, it, it didn't work out that way. My first couple of years were in private practice and through that experience, I had the opportunity to uh, interview at multiple different places and be propositioned uh, multiple different uh, odd uh, uh, scenarios that many could potentially learn from and happy to share uh, some <laughs> from those experiences. In addition to that, um, also just had also some experience in interviewing applicants, whether they're for the fellowship program or, uh, or as potential attendings to join as uh, faculty. So happy to answer questions regarding that. So what I wish I had known, um, apologies, my dog is about to start barking here. Um, but uh, I can, the big thing is um, uh, the perspective. So um, as a physician, as physicians, a lot of us are, you know, have a very competitive mindset, right? So we all wanna be the best of what we, best of whatever we it is we do right but in reality when it comes to job interviews and uh, the workplace collaboration is really key and understanding that and understanding that how do how can i use my skill set to help the group right so i think uh during the interview process uh, i'm trying to sell myself you know I'm, I'm perfect for this job i'm everything to everybody um, but that's absolutely the wrong way to go about that and happy to elaborate further. What I see fellows doing well or not well, uh, what I see a lot of fellows doing great uh, in their job search is uh, connecting early on, whether even as medical students, uh, uh, as residents, reaching out to program directors, letting, you know, getting, getting themselves known, uh, letting people understand what, the, what drives them and their motivations um, and connecting. So Dr. Poindexter had highlighted on networking and also being honest with yourself. Um, so uh, in terms of not well, uh, just kind of what I had mentioned before is that sometimes during these interview, the interview process, somebody or oftentimes applicants, uh, particularly in the transition from fellow to uh, attending will often uh, say, yes, I'm happy to do that, happy to do this, happy to do, everything but then you have a, a hard time understanding what uh, what motivates them what drives them and what will really make them happy um, so I'll stop there awesome I think Lauren is I think Dr. Rudolph is getting her is getting her phone um, from her office closet. Um, one day, Lauren will be a big girl and she'll have a real office, but for now it's a closet. Um, and we're gonna move on, we're gonna move on. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Barchi, um, will you share a little bit more about yourself um, and then also address these two questions? Sure, thank you so much. Um, so I actually, my whole goal with my career in sports medicine was to do what I'm currently working on, which is build a um, dance and performance medicine center to serve the greater Philadelphia area, which is where I grew up. Um, so everything from my decision about where to go to residency, to fellowship, to where I would spend the first few years of my attending hood was all based on preparing me for that. So my initial job search was very easy. It happened during my interview for fellowship where I said, 
oh, Harkness, this is precisely what I want to build. I want you to know I would be a great candidate for this institution as an attending. So I interviewed for my job at the same time as interviewing for my fellowship. Um, and so that was kind of straightforward. Um, but then I ended up having to be able to move on so I could actually accomplish the goal for which I entered sports medicine. Um, so that was an interview process too. Um, mine was very much like uh, Dr. Poindexter had mentioned um, reaching out to professional friends of friends. So mine was um, for the most part kind of behind the scenes. I would, you know, the chair of top sports program, I happened to know his sister-in-law. And so, you know, we would have a conversation in Maryland uh, on a dock um, and we would chat about what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and that was sort of like the job interview. And so, you know, that's kind of how I went about trying to figure out where I wanted to um, fit in before I really dug my teeth in and started um, pushing for actual job interviews and contract offers, et cetera. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that could be said about what you wish you had known when it came to the job search, you know, that kind of, I was, I'm very good at listening to advice. So that was there. Um, there's all sorts of things you can say about what it's actually like to be in attending versus what it's like to be protected as a trainee. Um, but that's probably a conversation for another day. And Sal is laughing right now. <laughs> Sal and I used to work together, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, what I see fellows doing well or not well, um, I would I would reiterate what Sal said. It's really important. In fact, it's absolutely vital to have a balance between um, what you want long term. I'm really good at looking five to ten years ahead in the future, but I'm not so good at looking at the granular level of what makes each day if at sometimes tolerable, you know, it's not going to be this isn't insta fabulous. Every day is going to be work. It's going to be work. But what is work that's going to be okay, is going to fuel you, keep you going, that you're not going to wake up, you know, puking in between patients because you're so stressed out, what's not going to drain you? Because if, you're, if your bricks are not sound, if your everydays are not sound, the whole castle will not hold. And that, so it's good to have those long-term goals, but it's also really good to be honest with yourself about what your day-to-day -day looks like. My favorite example of this, and then I'll, I'll stop, is we're all trained to say we like research, right? That's like the one question to look good in your interview. You always say, well, I want to do research. What kind of research do you have? And some people honestly care. Some people honestly like research. Not everyone does. So if you're that person for whom it's work, it's real work, and you're just, you, you kind of say it because you have to say it it's okay to let go of that when, you know, you're looking for a job. It doesn't, especially once you become responsible for it, if you don't have the resources and the time to be able to keep going, if you're, and you're in a uh, institution where there's a pressure to publish, you know, a few papers a year, that's a lot. That's a lot of pressure on top of already going through that huge learning curve of becoming and attending. So again, make sure your bricks are sound, understand the architecture of your castle, but make sure your bricks, which are the everyday of your job, make sure those are sound so that everything can hold. That's a fabulous um, insight. Um, I think I would add to that uh, what, like, what you're doing every day, the people that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis really matters. I'm not sure I thought about that a ton for my first job. Um, and then location maybe matters more. People and things I wasn't thinking about, but I, that's a really good point. Um, and both um, Elizabeth and Salver both have made really good points so far. So um, I'm impressed with the panel already. Um, I'm super excited to introduce Dr. Alicia Gendish. Uh, Alicia was actually my co-fellow uh, at um, at Iowa, um, and she's, I don't think I, can I say this on a recording YouTube? She's, she's a total bad A. She's super <laughs> awesome, um, and um, she's emergency medicine and has a lot of really great insight to share, uh, especially having um, been in the military prior to um, 
going back to medical school and stuff. And you can kind of share more about that. Dr. Gende. Yes, thank you so much for having me here. Um, great presentation. I think it's awesome that um, AMSSM is putting these things out there. I'll say that's one of the great things that I see fellows doing now is utilizing resources like this. Um, so that's great. Uh, yes, I am a former um, RN. I was a nurse for 11 years. Um, and some of those years were serving active duty in the United States Navy. Um, and then uh, working as a flight nurse is kind of where I was like, you know, I'm going to I'm going to jump ship, pun intended, and um, <laughs> go to go to medical school. Um, ended up still in emergency departments um, and doing a residency in emergency medicine and then fellowship at Iowa with Lauren. Um, and now I'm working 50% um, emergency medicine and 50% sports medicine. So I have two clinic days a week. I'm also um, a head team physician for the Division Three college around here, um, St. Mary's University in Winona. Um, and then we also do just various uh, coverage events like with the lacrosse marathon and whatnot here. Um, so very fortunate to have ended up um, getting such a great job at such a great location that was good for my family and good for me. Uh, what I wish I had known um, would have, I guess I would say it's something I'm kind of still learning. And that is, uh, I wish I would have known my worth. And what I mean by that is how much I have the ability to negotiate. Um, and it could be for different things, not just to make more money. It could be for sports coverage. It could be for, um, you know, paid paid leave. It could be for CME. It could be um, for different shifts in the emergency department. Uh, hey, I, I'll never work a night shift or I'll only work night shifts or, or whatnot. I think um, if I would have known uh, kind of like know your worth or know your ability to negotiate, I think that's super valuable as you're entering um, the job search. And I think also... Um, I would say in your first year, first two years, kind of cut yourself some slack because you're trying to learn how to be an attending in two different things that are totally similar and totally different at the same time. You're working with two different teams. Um, so those of us that go into sports medicine and end up kind of working both of our specialties, um, just give yourself a little bit of slack and, and take a deep breath every once and again is, mm -hmm. is what I would say. And yeah, I like... Um, I, I uh, give a shout out to the, the new Lieutenant Colonel out there. So thank you for your service and, and all of the military folks out there. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. Um, okay, um, we are, I think next is Dr. Shelley Street Calendar, um, who is also amazing in her own right. I feel like everyone's had some decent introductions, but Dr. Calendar, um, do you want to introduce yourself and let us know what you wish you'd known and what you see fellows doing well or not? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for the invitation. This has been already a wonderful session and it's a privilege to be a part of it. I am currently in Macon, Georgia at Mercer University School of Medicine and Atrium. I, I even forget sometimes our We just lost you, Dr. Calendar. Are you still there? I am still here, but I did lose you. I'm not sure what last you heard, but um, we hear I wanted you now. To... Excellent, excellent. So thanks for the invitation again, and it's been a, a wonderful session already. I am in Macon, Georgia at um, Mercer University and uh, Atrium Navison, and our hospital just went underneath a name change. All of the signs haven't even been, I think, transitioned. So we're going into Atrium at Navison Hospital, that's in Macon, Georgia. And um, my background is a little, is internal medicine and pediatrics. And when I embarked on that as a residency choice, I did not have the intention of going into sports medicine. And sports medicine sort of fell into my lap as far as what I was doing as uh, internal medicine and pediatric resident. And so I um, got into it because I was just volunteering for a inner city hospital in Detroit, Michigan. And that inner city um, high school that I was volunteering at sort of reached out and asked me to cover their sports teams. And at the um, supervision support of my residency director and associate residency director, I became their team physician as a resident and continued that relationship. And so that's sort of my pathway in. 
I think what I wish I had known, and you all have access to all this, is the, the wealth of knowledge of the information for your colleagues who have already gone through sports medicine as a career choice. And so using the information and data that we have, I think is useful. Uh, one of the other things that when I think back to my first job position, which was absolutely the right choice for me at the time, um, is that I think I should have looked maybe at a couple more jobs just for a well-rounded um, idea of what else was out there. I really only applied to two jobs and I wanted to be in Detroit, Michigan. And at the time, I um, I also didn't want to lose my med peds home. So I actually went back to my where I trained in my residency after my fellowship and joined the faculty there and kept both arms. So you talk about feeling like you're a little bit all over the place. Our hospital, and this is another gear to understanding what you're going to do when you're there. I think in my situation, I did understand it because I had done residency there and I had actually done an additional year as chief resident there. Uh, and so I had a real good understanding of how things work, but one may not want to embark on what I embarked on first year after fellowship in that we had a freestanding children's hospital and you could not see children under the age of 16 in any of the other hospitals. And then we had a freestanding um, inpatient and outpatient rehab hospital. And there were certain patients they wouldn't let you see in um, a different space than that. And so I literally had an adult sports clinic, a pediatric sports clinic, a med piece clinic, and then an appointment to both the departments of pediatrics, internal medicine, and family medicine. So um, that understanding of where you might be and what space you might be in, I think is really key. What I see in fellows now, I, we don't have fellows where I'm currently at, and we've been trying to start that fellowship, but my first position out, we actually started a fellowship while I was there. And so I have a lot of interaction with our residents going into from all of our disciplines, from medicine, from family, from pediatrics right now, going into sports medicine and also looking for their own job um, sources. And then the medical students who have some interest already in sports medicine and want to have some advice as to where they should go. And so I think when you're looking at your job, you need to, before you actually embark on your um, choice, you want to figure out what it is you really want even if the first job isn't exactly what you want when you get there, know what it is that you really want without others influence. So with being true to yourself at what you want and then sort of stick into that as you go through your interview. So like someone else said earlier, don't pretend like you love research if you don't love research, but also if you don't like to take care of the senior athlete, don't pretend that you like to take care of a senior athlete. So you just wanna know where it is that your heart really lies so that you can be true to yourself as you're going through these interview process. That's a great, great point. Um, just, yeah, being true to yourself. And I think trying to define what that job is actually going to entail is, is sometimes like what it's gonna feel like when you're in the job is actually really hard to do when you're, before you're in that job. But as much as you can do that, I think it is going to be helpful for job choice. Um, so next we have Dr. Nathaniel Nye, um, who I have recently gotten to know a little bit more um, with the ultrasound committee. Um, so super excited to hear what you have to say. So you want to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit more and give us your insight. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and again, thanks for having me. This is awesome to be a part of. And I think it's really cool that these types of things are happening. So Lauren and Lauren, thank you. And um, always fun to uh, to be on a call with you. So um, yeah, um, I am uh, active duty uh, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel recently pinned on in May. So uh, they'll promote about anybody, it appears. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I am currently working at the Military Sports Medicine Fellowship in the DC area. We train uh, eight fellows a year in our program. I think it's the largest fellowship in the country. We, there may be one other program that's pretty close, um, but a uh, large fellowship. And we also have a consortium with um, 
like four other programs in town, which uh, all together we have about 14 fellows that we train every week, almost every, almost, um, so two times a week, we have all 14 together that we're teaching. So um, good times out here. Um, I've been here since 2019. Before that, I was at uh, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. That is the Air Force's training hub. That is the gateway to the Air Force. Um, basic training happens there. 40,000 young civilian high school graduates uh, come out and we turn them into airmen. Uh, I was the first sports medicine physician to go there and um, built a big program. Scary, uh, scary prospect, but um, yeah, <laughs> similar to how uh, sometimes you put a, you know, a, a young 26 year old uh, pilot in a $2 billion aircraft. Uh, you sometimes in the military, you may be a, a quite junior uh, individual and be put into a position that uh, a lot of opportunity is in front of you. Um, so I and my team out there uh, built um, a lot of things. We built a team of uh, sports medicine uh, uh, physicians and athletic trainers. Now there's 30 athletic trainers and six docs supporting that uh, enterprise of uh, military basic training. Um, huge and awesome experience there. Um, so uh, before that, I was uh, here at the same fellowship where I'm now faculty. Um, so yeah. Um, the military is um, is uh, quite a unique environment. Um, Alicia, that's awesome that you are out there serving as well. So hats off to you and everyone else who's serving. Um, you get the opportunity to uh, to go into a number of uh, uh, I guess unexpected environments. Um, I've been to Afghanistan, uh, Qatar. I've been to Cuba. I've been to uh, various locations and. Uh, in Europe and Africa briefly, but um, the military puts you in situations where uh, you will be the expert and there may not be another person like you in the whole country. And uh, there may be 10,000 civilians from all over the world on that facility who are going to come to you uh, for, for various different types of issues. So it's a really unique opportunity that puts you in touch with uh, uh, some opportunities to serve you wouldn't otherwise have. Um, it's nice in the military that you don't have to deal with insurance companies or um, who's covered or, um, or who's not. Um, there's also a lot of BS that we have to deal with that, that civilians don't have to. We also get paid less, which is, uh, uh, I guess there's give and take. But uh, anyway, we'll focusing on these uh, questions that you have in front of me. I wanted to share a couple of thoughts. Number one is that um, you know, you have to work hard no matter what and, and establish yourself uh, from day one. Just like uh, Lauren Poindexter said, assume that every interaction is, a, uh, is an interview. I think the few interactions before that are really an interview too. Like you, you build your reputation um, from long before you meet the people who you're going to be potentially working for. And so uh, build that uh, reputation of being a hard worker, a team player, a collaborator, and um, someone who has a positive attitude, a can-do attitude, and people will want to work with you, they'll gravitate to you. And then um, I have seen uh, right now, as I'm, I'm actually at a crossroads in my career where I have the opportunity to either separate from the military or stay in or choose, I really have like a lot of different uh, potential pathways that are open to me. Um, and I, uh, in, in one regard, I have a lot of really hard decisions to make because I have, I have a lot of opportunities. I could stay in, I could do flight medicine. I could go take care of PJs, uh, special ops. I could take care of fighter pilots. I could go, uh, back to a residency or I could get out and do civilian stuff. Um, but, uh, in a lot of ways that's hard, but in a lot of ways, uh, I think that, um, the work that I did as a resident and even as a medical student um, paved the way that that opens doors even much later in your career. Um, another uh, thing that I think is worth noting, at least this has been true in my experience, is that um, uh, opportunities take time to unfold. And uh, it may not be like a quick, easy answer. 
So buckle up, job searches are not fast and uh, it can take many months, even years. Um, and what may look really promising at first may completely fall flat. And there you are months later after investing all that time and all those conversations or visits um, and it may go nowhere, it may go up in smoke. Um, and then, or you may have another fabulous opportunity that presents itself at the 11th hour um, and you end up going somewhere completely different. Um, so I guess, as we often say in the military, Semper Gumby, be flexible, be open to uh, change. And uh, in the same note, um, be willing to seize those opportunities because um, uh, I guess, and this is something that I would say that I, as far as what I see fellows doing well or sometimes not doing well, you, um, I think younger, younger individuals uh, have a tendency to, I guess, gravitate or, or fixate on something that they want. Um, and when it's not, when it doesn't turn out that way, it can be really disappointing. Um, but um, I think the, uh, a more, I guess, uh, mature or uh, season perspective would be that you can make things good. And um, if you are like in the military, sometimes you get put somewhere, like it may not be your first choice to go X, Y, Z location. Um, uh, but you know what, make the best of it. And uh, every, no matter where you go, you can help build a culture, shape a team, um, infuse new energy, you can uh, influence priorities there, and you can create something good, make it what you want to be and find those um, opportunities to, to learn and grow yourself um, and uh, continue your, your onward upward journey. So uh, sometimes I have seen some, some young docs go out and, and they will just kind of, uh, I guess, berate the military some some people are like man i regret this this is so stupid and every time they come to work they're like man why did i join the military and and they let everyone know around them that this sucks and nobody wants to be around that person like that totally kills the spirit and uh, nobody wants to be around them so uh, don't be that uh, be positive uh, find the good create the good and everyone will gravitate around you and it just kind of becomes infectious so um, maybe one last, and I feel like I'm maybe getting a little philosophical, but um, I do think this is important. Um, you are going to change. And it takes years to figure yourself out. So um, I guess I would just throw that into any career search opportunity. Uh, I guess keep in mind that who you are today may not be exactly who you are tomorrow. And allow yourself um, uh, patience and and opportunities to uh, to grow and um, and honestly look at yourself and what is important to me. What are my values truly? Not just what mom, dad, mentor X or other person X say should be important to me, but truly be honest and look inside yourself and what is my what are my values and grow into those and, and continuously reevaluate yourself. And um, uh, yeah, I guess I uh, don't wanna rant uh, too much about that, but um, uh, in my own uh, midlife crisis, I have done a lot of uh, thinking about what is important to me. And um, I'm thankful for uh, the people who have influenced me. And uh, I guess be willing to keep on giving because um, as you grow pretty soon, you'll be that person who's helping someone else out. So I'll, I'll uh, leave it there. Um, Nate, I, that was really good advice. Um, I think a lot of things I personally needed to hear at this particular point in my life, which is awesome. So I truly appreciate your uh, words of wisdom. I'd say um, just like certain points that it's like people say this all the time and I just wanted to reiterate your first job is doesn't have to be your forever job um and um I just kind of sums up some of the things that you were saying and then also I find the military perspective fascinating so I really appreciate sh you sharing that with us 
And then the third thing I wanted to say is that if you do find yourself that negative person, if you have enough um, insight or clarity and you realize I'm that negative person that no one wants to be around, you're, you, you're not in the right job. Like it's time to move on. And if you can figure that out, you're, you're definitely ahead of the game. And so I think that's at least, you know, like the burnout can kind of make you realize like maybe you're not in the right place. So it's time to rethink that. Um, okay. All right. We are almost through our panel. Um, Awesome. So last but certainly not least, as I mentioned earlier, um, Dr. Caitlin Mooney, who has a lot of experience with the job search, um, is going to give her insight into these questions. Caitlin, do you want to take over? Sure. So I'll start out with um, a little bit of the um, how I got to where I am. I moved to San Antonio because my spouse was also a military doctor and I, I am not one, but um, he was, he's now out. So it gives us a little more flexibility. Um, but I wanted a job in San Antonio. I did apply outside of San Antonio just cause I wasn't sure what was going to end up happening. And actually that other job offer ended up being helpful for negotiating a job in San Antonio. So sometimes I recommend if you at all consider something it might still be useful to travel and see what they offer you because you, you have a lot more negotiation power if you have another job offer on, in your hand. So I started out in San Antonio doing locums actually in general pediatrics for a couple months. And I had been a little bit more not traditional job search. Um, one group had kind of promised me a job for a long time, but it fell through. So I was just cold emailing um, places in town. Um, they weren't necessarily getting back to me. So I, like I said, I had another job offer in hand. So I did a Hail Mary um, set of emails that said, I have a job offer at a pretty national renowned uh, place. Uh, I was gonna move if I didn't get a job offer that week um, and that they wouldn't hear from me again. And I actually got a job offer from that email, which is a very strange way to get my first job. Um, and like I said, I did have some negotiation power. I was working for the county med system, which is huge in San Antonio, doing primary care sports medicine and part-time urgent care. It was actually a really good job right out of um, fellowship. Uh, the pay was good because they have a lot of state funding. And then, um, it also gave me a lot of experience in a really, really busy urgent care, which actually helps for taking care of, I feel like the division one athletes, which a lot of it is illnesses. Um, from there, I was working with our academic side, our ortho specialists are actually hired on the academic side instead of the county med. So um, they kind of just said, hey, I think we're trying to get some primary care sports med docs. Do you want to interview? So I ended up interviewing there and getting the job possibly even before it was posted. Um, so that's how I got my second job. Now I do all sports medicine um, and I take care of um, D1 athletes at UTSA. I also am the um, course director for the MSK and DERM part of the med school second year curriculum. So that's been actually a really fun thing that I didn't really expect. Um, that's been really um, a, a great source of growth and also really kind of diversifies me going forward that I have a, um, a lot of, a, quite a bit of experience with medical education um, on the undergraduate side. So it was something I wasn't really thinking about doing, but when the opportunity came about, I took advantage of it and got that position. So some pearls I think about for job searching is one, I've kind of already told you that I, most of my jobs have not come from um, traditional posting. And that includes um, people have contacted me through the AMSSM, even from doing these series that they would like, they'd be interested in, um, in hiring me. So you don't know where you're gonna get a job offer. Also another job I interviewed for right out of fellowship 
that I turned down ended up recontacting me. So a lot of your jobs will not come from formal job searches. I also, one of the other big pearls I have is don't feel um, like you have to apply to only jobs that you are 100% qualified for. Um, a lot of people aren't 100% qualified for the jobs that they apply to. Um, if there's something that doesn't include pediatrics, I still apply to it. Uh, I still get contacts back. Some of them then are like, no, we actually don't want you. But some of them are like, oh, we didn't really consider that. We can still interview you. Um, and then I've had, you know, there's been opportunities where someone will interview you. They don't, they put, don't pick you for the, that job, but they keep you in mind later. So um, I... On the AMSSM board, I don't pay attention to whether I'm actually qualified for what I've applied to. Kind of similar to the Hail Mary application. What's the worst that can happen is they don't call you and they say no. Um, and other things is just don't, you're, a lot of my cohort of fellows did not keep their first job more than two to three years and some less than a year. So if you have another opportunity come up and it's not even a year, it's okay to move on if that wasn't the ideal job for you. One of the exciting things is um, right now on the AMSSM job board, I've seen more jobs than almost any other time that I've been at a fellowship. So it's a really exciting time to be looking, but that doesn't mean that you have to stay married to your job. Um, and then another thing is I, if even if you're interviewing for jobs and say you really wanted to be the position for soccer and that's unavailable right now, if the bones are good of the program, like they're putting investments into sports medicine, um, that's been one of the things that I found that a lot of my colleagues have um, had their job dissolve after one or two years was really like no one marketed for them the 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 division was like, oh, I guess we could kind of use some sports med docs, but then they didn't really invest in the program. If the bones are good, it's a lot more important than maybe some of those little details. Because you never know when that other person wants to do something different or it might be just a couple years before you can kind of change to those small things into your favor. That's yeah. It. Caitlin, those are great points, um, especially like the one about applying to jobs that you might not be, um, or you might not think you're qualified for. I think I definitely, I definitely applied to a lot of family medicine jobs um, as a PM&R sports fellow, but with, after fellowship, I felt like I was just, as qualified to do sports family as I was um, PM and R sports. So, um, and I think that topic comes up a lot, at least in PM and R, there's always this discussion or fight about, you know, we can do primary care too, if you want to. Um, um, and I'd be curious to know if that comes up in other specialties in, I guess, emergency or, or is it just is that like a very consistent pm and r thing does anyone have any oh when we end at um we end around now do <laughs> do you want to keep um i have like a bunch of questions it, that we can discuss do you want to end the actual recording or do you want to keep going lauren What's, it, I don't have a question. I just was having trouble finding my um, mute button. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we would love for our audience to share with us, where are you in training? Um, are you a resident? Are you a current fellow, recent past fellow, um, et cetera? Because, you know, understanding kind of who we're chatting with, who we're talking to is so valuable. Um, and I appreciate all of you for being here today, both our panelists and our attendees. Um, this again will be available, um, you know, to watch later if you're interested or please let your 
fellow residents, med students, fellows know um, so that they can, they can learn from this collective wisdom. Um, if anybody has additional questions, please put them in the chat. Um, also, we did note in the chat that next Wednesday is going to be another installment of our awesome sports economics series. Um, next Wednesday's webinar is going to be on things to keep in mind regarding finances and retirement. So um, also very, very, you know, valuable, um, obviously from a dollar amount, um, but Dr. Portugal is involved in those lectures as well, where he gets to put his MBA to work. Uh, so questions in the chat, um, we'll go ahead and look through those. If anybody has um, a particularly sensitive question, you can make a note too, um, or if you wanna address um, any of those questions, either to Dr. Rudolph or myself personally, um, you can do that as well. And then um, probably after like a few minutes, like 10 minutes or so, we'll turn off the record button. If y'all need to go, totally understand on the East Coast, it's awfully late. So thank you all for sticking around. Um, panelists, thank you for sharing your evening with us. If um, if some of the panelists are able to stick around with us, that would be awesome. Um, but no worries if, you know, home duties, home duties call. So, all right, let's go ahead and look at, also, if anybody wants to not chat in, you know, not type into the chat, you can unmute yourself as well. Let's see some of the topics that were brought up in chat. Um, I did want to note um, Dr. Portugal's um, sports specialty is martial arts. Dr. Barchi alluded to performing arts. She's a former professional ballerina. Um, I have a dance and cheer and gymnastics background and springboard diving. Um, if anybody else, I know, <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't laugh. Um, <laughs> Dr. Rudolph played lacrosse in college. Did I get that right? It was lacrosse, right? Um, and if, any, if anybody else has particular sports um, interests, um, you can go ahead and ask us those questions as well. Oh, I love this. Um, Logan Wills mentioned that Dr. Gendy is local famous um, for placing IVs for the football players at Iowa. Yay, great job. I blame it all on my nursing skills, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, I was like, that's your nursing skills. That's not your doctoring skills. <laughs> yeah, seriously impressive. <laughs> Um, I think it's fantastic, y'all, that we have such an incredible diversity of primary specialties here. Um, I love Dr. Nye um, and Dr. Gendy. Thank you for speaking from a military background as well. Um, question for you, Nate. Um, what about civilians being employed by the military? Is that an option? Yes, it is. And in fact, um, I helped uh, two young sports medicine doctors in San Antonio who are now working as government mm -hmm. civilians. One is a contractor and one is a GS or a uh, civil servant uh, gov uh, GS, uh, gov uh, government service uh, civilian, um, both working in the clinic that I built in San Antonio at Air Force Basic Training. So uh, yeah, it happens. There are GS and civilian uh, or civilian contractor jobs within um, within the military. There's not a lot of sports medicine um, jobs out there. Um, Elliot Hu is another good example. He is a government uh, civilian uh, working at the Navy's um, sports medicine fellowship at Camp Pendleton. Um, so a lot of it uh, really comes down to who you know. Uh, so use that network and um, uh, if you can, um, you know, demonstrate uh, a, uh, an, you know, a, a valuable background and a true interest in, you know, making somebody who's on the inside of the military believe that you truly would be a good fit, there may be a way to like um, create a billet or create a job. So um I guess it's much the same. I, I think in my uh, civilian job searching, it, it's a lot more effective to search through people you know than necessarily uh, that that website that lists the the nameless uh, jobs. 
where you don't have a connection. So uh, reach out through your network and um, yeah, there, there are uh, multiple jobs out there. The VA has a lot of opportunities. Um, and then you start getting into other things like, um, you know, uh, the rural and uh, like the Indian healthcare and public health service. And um, uh, you can start to get creative. There's the Air National Guard, Army National Guard. Um, there's um, reserves. And um, so if you're willing to, uh, you know, do a, a weekend a month and uh, two weeks out of the year uh, and, uh, you know, you can, you can be in the guard. There's opportunities to deploy or there's, you know, different opportunities there, uh, there where you can stay pretty much uh, all in one place, but I'll stop there. Things to think about. Since I've been in San Antonio for a while, um, Lock Lackland and uh, Bamsey have both contacted me about um, becoming a contractor. So it's really who you know, which has been a common theme. So there if you've heard me talk, just consider that you know me, reach out to me so I can, uh, or other people, we can, we can help you. Uh, we can easily build that network. Awesome. Thank you so much for that insight, um, Dr. Nye. There is a, one of our attendees, Jackie, had a question about what are some questions that we should ask in interviews, particularly to gauge how we can be supported as early career physicians. I will let any of our panelists jump in and address that. So interview questions that um, fellows may want to ask. I think I could just jump. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I, I think one of the first things to ask is anything that you have questions about regarding um, sports coverage or procedures um, the types of patients you want to see, you know, or what you have in mind, your perfect job, is it, is it a possibility at that job? Um, and if it's not currently um, well-structured in that kind of way, is there a possibility to create it for you or uh, do they give you the autonomy to start to create it? So that I would start there. I think we had another great question. Um, thank you, Brandon, for shouting out from UConn. Um, he asked, what recommendations do any of our panelists have in terms of reaching out after the initial application? Do any of you recommend touching base a few weeks after it? Um, and how else, is there another way to contact a program if you're applying through the Career Center and you don't see anyone's name listed? So a couple questions there for anyone who wants to take that. So we recently went through a process at Christiana where we hired two more colleagues after I came on. Um, so I was a part of that and it really informed my process uh, applying to Christiana myself. Um, sometimes it takes like weeks between like, and it's nothing, nothing about you. It's nothing about the interview. It's just that the institution is slow. And so, um, you know, if you're neurotic, like I am, I would reach out. Usually I give them at least a week, sometimes two weeks to be really polite, but you want to stay on their radar. You want to show your interest and you want to make sure that, cause it does make a difference. You know, if you're someone who's like, hi, bye, you might not stand out quite as much as someone who's like, hey, so remember what we talked about? I have further questions or I just wanted to let you know this update, super cool thing that just happened. Um, and just keeping them posted about, you know, just trying to stay on the radar and, and um, you know, keep in touch without being annoying, of course. Um, but uh, so it's one of those, you could make a gif of like, will they call me back or not? Um, but there's no like three day rule of when you can text back. Uh, you can't, I would advise waiting at least a week sometimes. And I, Dr. Poindexter raises a good point. When you first start interviewing 
or you know, towards the end of your interview, say, how long does your process typically take? You know, when might I expect, when would be an appropriate time for me to expect a response um, after this interview? One, that shows maturity. And two, that also, you know, shows that you are self-respecting and that you have value and you should be respected with a response. They shouldn't just ghost you either. Um, and so whatever they say, if they say, give us a couple weeks, that means two to three and you're writing back, oh, how is, how's everything going? Remember me. Um, so yeah, so getting a good idea of how fast or slow, cause they might have sometimes, I mean, I just hail married and asked how many people are you interviewing for this job? And they were like a couple and I was like, okay, great. So, you know, it might not be too many people they're looking at. Um, and so that gives you an idea. And then you ask what, when, when will it be annoying for me to write back to you? Cause I'm going to ride that line. Um, but yeah, you know, I think Dr. Barchi touches upon something interesting, you know, always just being professional and, and extending that courtesy. Um, Andy Meyer um, with AMSSM mentioned that if you really are truly trying to get in contact with someone, you cannot figure out how to, um, how to reach them. You can reach out to AMSSM. You can also look for, use the find a doc feature and you may be able to find them that way. Um, so again, ASM, AMSSM is here to help you um, in so many different areas. Um, additionally, some people may find that after they're in the job market for a while, they, you know, have interests that are gravitating towards a certain area and they may want to get another degree. I know Dr. Portugal did that recently and got his MBA because he had a special interest in a, um, in a very um, fascinating field of sport uh, aspect of sports medicine. You may also consider doing a second fellowship if you really need to. Um, but remember that your identity as a professional is really going to change over time. So again, um, like Dr. Nye mentioned, Semper Gumby, um, do give yourself the room to grow. And if you like, doc, you know, as Dr. Barchi was mentioning, you know, communicating with the programs that you've applied to, um, or as Dr. Mooney said, you may not be 100% qualified for a specific position, but if there's something about that organization that you particularly value, do let them know that. Um, do say, you know, I have family in this area. Even if, even if you don't believe I'm like a perfect fit for this job, please keep me in mind. Um, you know, we'd be very interested in relocating to the area, et cetera. So if you're genuine in showing your interest, um, they may not pick you for that job, but they may come back around in a year or two and say, hey, I remember this applicant. They really demonstrated, you know, genuine interest in our program. Let's look at other questions from the chat. There is a question. Can I say too, like I would remind oh, yes, everybody jump in. that you've already done this one time before, right? We already did that a couple times before. You did it with med school. You did it with residency. You did it with fellowship. You know how to reach out. You know how to be polite. You know, like okay, it's been a couple days. It's been a week. Like we're, you know, you know how to do this. It's not. It's not really a different game. The stakes may be higher, but it's it's not really a different game. You've done this before. I um thanks Alicia. I um I was just reading in the very beginning of the chat I um there's a question that I think is worth circling back to um regarding besides the AMSSM job board what are other good resources to look for job opportunities and then specifically and with regard to getting involved with NCAA athletics um and so I, I will say from personal ex, um, experience, I actually just Googled jobs and, and um, created a Google jobs alert. And then you get an alert in your email, if, however, however many times you want it or don't want it. Um, and that's how I found my first job. Um, so yeah, you know, Google it. And then, um, but the other thing was for NCAA athletics specifically, there often are not 
um, physician specific jobs, but sometimes there can be, it's the D1 ticker. I don't know if anyone else is following the D1 ticker, but I, um, at my, I followed it uh, or still use it. Um, just, I guess also Google the D1 ticker um, or I can send out a link, but it sends daily which might be an might be overkill, but it sends daily updates about what's going on within NCAA athletics, um, and that can be really helpful to stay on top of that as well. And then, um, as far as that question is concerned, um, does anyone else want to chime in on where they, you know, where they look? You know, so it's like it's networking, it's who you know. Um, and then there's the AMSSM job board, and I mentioned Google and D1 ticker, but does anyone else have any other suggestions for places to look and dig around? ACSM as well. Um, American College for Sports Medicine can be helpful. Um, I remember seeing jobs there. I would say take advantage of AMSSM's fellowship fair. So even though you're not necessarily applying for a fellowship, clearly that's you know, where all the team positions are. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm always open to the opportunity to speak about any kind of attending jobs. Uh, I'm sure other, uh, you know, other hospitals, other attendings are too. Last but not least, um, if, if y'all turn down a job or you take a job and you have to like relinquish that acceptance, um, just remember to do so, which is with as much professionalism as possible. This is a really small network. Um, it's, it's a fairly small world. You don't want to burn bridges. Um, and so do remember things happen, right? Like family members get sick. You're unable to relocate for some number of reasons. If you've already taken a position, please communicate um, any changes in your plan as soon as possible um, and do so again with the utmost kindness and professionalism um, because you just never know who's talking to who, who's you know involved with whom on a professional level um, and you really want to make sure that your um, name is clean so to speak. Um, also social media, we did not touch upon that, um, but do consider that your presence on social media um, can work for or against you. I'm looking um, on, you know, I, um, Dr. Mooney and Dr. Portugal, I know that both of your spouses are physicians. Is anybody else on here um, have a spouse as a physician? Because that can take some, um, that can take some unique um, shifting around depending upon where you do or don't um, need to live and move, et cetera. So um, if you wanted to contact either of them about some personal questions, kind of how they did things, how you might do things, um, do consider that. Um, Dr. Nye has to leave, Dr. Calendar already left. Um, thank you so much for all of your time. I understand if y'all need to go cause it's getting awfully late, um, but Thank you again for you know, sharing all of your wisdom this evening. It's been fantastic.